fucking talking about? Holy, Holy shit. shit. Holy shit. <laughs> so freaking bad wrestle me welcome everybody to juice pro wrestling episode 199 to the extreme with harry fucking slash That's right. You know him as the man behind ECW's main theme and a lot of the combatants theme songs like Sabu and Taz. Who could blues? Who could ever forget? It's one of my favorite songs. Uh -huh. to get a little lifted to, if you know what I mean. The man, the myth, the legend himself. Harry Slash from Harry Slash to the Slash Toads. How the fuck are you doing tonight? Yeah, I'm not going to talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> I would kill my throat. Jerry Lynn used to speak like that in conversations as a goof. And I'm like, my heart, my throat hurts just listening to you, dude. <laughs> well, What's brother, up, guys? Dude. Thanks for having me on. Just want to correct. Fucking is not my middle name. That somehow or another. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah, every, everybody calls me Harry fucking slash. I, I may just have to go to City Hall and, you know, change my driver's license to that. Yes, so that, please do. You know, when the cop looks at my name slash Harry comma fucking what? <laughs> <laughs> Are you fucking Harry? <laughs> Might be you, brother, if you don't watch out. <laughs> Indeed. Damn, I was misinformed. Dude, that's a good uh, jumping point, though. You, We'll just fucking dive right into this, man, because you bring up Jerry Lynn. Uh, yeah. Me and Bodie, are, and I sent you a video earlier today, uh, you know, kind of like the music we do and stuff like yeah. underground death metal grindcore. And yeah. I know Jerry was a big fan of that shit. And dude, and Balls Mahoney wearing like immolation shirts yes. back in the day. Dying Jerry Lynn shirts. wearing dying fetus. Yeah, like. Mm -hmm. so fucking cool and that's that to me exemplified how fucking cool and how counter culture ecw was because ecw dude it was it was a revolution in professional wrestling it was it was a moment in time like woodstock like the limelight where all the elements came together you know jupiter aligned with mars and all that hokey shit happened because a a company and a television program like ecw could not happen today no nor could it have happened 10 years earlier than it did you know yeah. it was just that right moment to go in there it's like let's let's give the world something that's like nc-17 you know that anybody under 18 is going to like sneak into another friend's house to watch it. So their parents don't know about it. And we're going to be sexist. We're going to be violent. We're going to be borderline racist. We're going to do some really fucked up shit, but it's part of a show and we're going to entertain the people. Never, never could have happened today. Some, I mean, there's a couple of companies out there that are coming close, but they're more like death metal, hardcore ECW wasn't just blood and guts. Remember ECW, was blood and guts, incredibly technically proficient matches like with Van Damme and Jerry Lynn and Malenko and Guerrero and those guys. And then you had compelling, completely midweek soap opera stuff going on, which was like one step above uh, All My Children or General yeah. Hospital. <laughs> yeah, dude, the story one, that one was great. One step below, actually. Some great storytelling, man. Um, Going back, though, like with uh, back in the day with Jerry Lynn, do you guys ever sit down? Do you ever sit down and talk with you about metal? Do you ever like dive into A that lot. scene? Back then, yeah. Yeah. I, um, at one point, I gave Jerry Lynn all a whole bunch of the CDs I was getting from like Metal Blade and Mega Force, nice. but they nice. would send me like triples and quadruples. So I'd keep one. And like, I'd go to the show the next, the next time I, I went to a show, it was like, Hey, Jerry, I got like a stack of like, you know, all this stuff. And you got your cookie monster music and I give balls, Mahoney stuff, you know, it's, it was their cup of tea, but you know, people do involve balls. I know was very heavily into 
King Diamond, I believe. Dude, brother, I just, I've known about King Diamond and Merciful Fate for 30 years. I said this a couple of weeks ago, but I, I blatantly hated it and ignored it. <laughs> and I have found him and I am thankful for the king because that shit fucking rips, dude. And merciful, merciful dude. Yeah. <laughs> dude, it's, it's, it's like whatever your personal tastes are into. Like my, me personally, I've got a very, very wide taste in music. Back when I was doing hookah blues, and this is extreme, I was also listening to Tom Waits and Bluegrass. Fuck yeah. You know, very nice. You know, plus we had other songs that, that I did, like Super Crazy's music has absolutely nothing to do with Sabu's music. They're not even in the same universe. You know, mm -hmm. so if you can diversify yourself, the, the form of music, the style of music, that death metal, hardcore you know, the I could never really figure it out. I love the music, but the vocals, I, I like to hear. I, I never could understand a word of what the guy said. Right. But much like Rob Zombie, White Zombie, the only line in any White Zombie song I ever understood is 1965. Yeah. 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 Everything else is <laughs> like... Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was almost like I thought he was making fun of the old blues singers, you know, that would just mumble through the Howling entire... Wolf or some shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but then recently my friend Ray said the way you have to look at that style of music is don't look. You have to look at the vocalist as another instrument. Yes. Yep. That forget the words. The words don't matter. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's it's the fourth or fifth instrument of the band. And you have to hear it in context with what everybody else is doing. Right. Almost, if, almost like a keyboard. Right. Or if you go back to, you know, I've used this example in a couple of conversations with friends um, and people that, you know, constantly like dog. Well, I don't understand it. It's like, OK, um, well, if you were a fan of like uh, like the reggae shit and the scatting or like the old jazz, you know, where mm -hmm. it's just the, the, it's the same thing. Your vo yeah. that voice was an instrument, you know, mm -hmm. dude, I, I listen to music from Persia, from Sri Lanka. Um, one of my favorite singers is Nushrat Fatih Ali Khan, who did the uh, Temptation of Christ soundtrack with Peter Gabriel. He's like one of the oh, greatest nice. singers of all time. I, I don't have a single clue what he's ever sang, but I listen to his stuff all the time. Yeah, it's you fucking know? awesome, man, how, how that stuff can reach you, you know, without yeah. you know, you don't have to understand. I mean, I, most of these kids listen to this fucking some of this rap nowadays. I don't know what the fuck It's rap so auto tuned. I don't know what's going on, man. <laughs> Well, from me personally, I've always said this. There is no right or wrong in music. There's just different. Right. But you can play a bad note. Let's say if you're in rock and you're playing a bad note. Oh, he played a bad note. But if you're doing it in jazz, they just call you inventive and creative. Right. Exactly. Improv, man. Yep. Odd time signature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Get on that Zappa <laughs> tip, man. Were you a oh, yeah, yeah, fan of Frank Zappa? Very much. That's uh, awesome. Very, very much so. Um, Big ton, big, big ass record collection. A lot of his CDs. One of my favorite records of all time is The Greatest Band You Never Heard, the live album. Yes, yes. Where he did Stairway to Heaven. Mm -hmm. I think they did he, Ring of Fire on there too, right? Ring of Fire and I think a Jimi Hendrix tune. Yeah, yeah, I believe uh, so. I think Purple Haze. But yeah. the way when he took Jimmy Page's guitar solo and transcribed it for a horn section note for note and it was absolutely brilliant insane yeah. i it, yeah. Bodie hit me up what was it a couple a couple months ago and you're like yeah, was. We, were, we were talking about zappa because dude i'm a huge zappa nut my oldest boy his middle name is zappa met dweezel mm -hmm. a couple of times uh my i got into it from my dad and i just like when i found it i was starting j uh, guitar in high school for jazz band and uh, that was kind of like my segue into that world, you know, because Frank was all over the place. You know, I mean, you want to do doo wop, you want to do jazz, yeah. like improv, all this shit. He was there like real realistically, his genre is just Zappa, because what do you call it? You know, avant garde, whatever, you know, like there's there's a YouTube video from an early talk show where he played a bicycle. Yeah. When he's all clean cut and shit. Yeah, I think that was the <laughs> soupy sales show or whatever that mm -hmm. was where they brought him out. Nobody had ever heard of him. And he played a bicycle. He played a song using a bicycle. Yeah. Dude, he was that. really big into like uh, Igor Stravinsky and stuff like that. Like just if you listen to stuff. It's like atmospheric and just mm -hmm. noises. And you, you know, you obviously you're a fan, man. Um, 
it's just amazing what that guy's been able to do. But you're talking about like how he's transcribed all this music and did all this shit. Like Bodie was like, Hey man, you know, we were talking about Zappa, you know, where's a good starting point. And I threw out some albums for him and shit. And he was like, listen, I just like, Holy shit, dude. Like, I'm like, yeah, it's fucking insane. Yeah. And the guy's work ethic, like bar none, like he's the type of dude, no matter what uh, medium you're doing, if you're mm-hmm. fucking flipping burgers, if you're a musician, if you're a construction worker, have that guy's work ethic because it was nonstop. He'd be on the yeah. shitter writing music. You know, there's posters of it, you know, famous posters like in the vault. Like I dude, I would kill to fucking be able to just be in there and see that shit and and touch it. And I just I just read that. uh I guess the Zappa family trust secured. Uh, they did some kind of deal with Universal Music Group. So now they're pumping out more. They got more control of like his something like that. He left something like 30 unfinished albums when he died. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, some of them were just written. No yeah. music. But he, he with Zappa, you get every note of every instrument scored out for you from. Right. You know, he, he'll write drum notes and what a drummer should be doing. So so he left the family a ridiculous amount of work, unfinished records and albums that hadn't even been recorded yet. Mm-hmm. Not to mention an endless, endless, ridiculous amount of of live material and tapes, I believe. Everything. Um, I can't remember the exact year, but I know it was starting with the mothers. It was I want to say it was still in the 60s, though. So it might have been tail end late 60s. He recorded every show he played audio and video it had like the yeah. soundboards and everything. So imagine, you know, people talk about like Prince having this vault and all this shit, dude, Zappa was doing it since the sixties. He had a good, what? 30, 40 year run of yeah. all this shit. But was, I might be mistaken, but I remember reading something like the family could release five albums a year or three albums a year. And they would all be dead before the last record comes out or something. <laughs> like all he ever yeah. did was write and record. He never did drugs. He never drank. No, nope. he, he, he Coffee wrote music. And he, yeah. He wrote music, recorded music and played music. And that was his entire life. Yeah, dude. I just, I fucking love the dude. I appreciate him. So for all of you watching and listening right now, go explore, find Frank Zappa. Because yes. once you do, and when you get it, it's it's just a world that of endless opportunity and it's you'll every time you'll he's one of my favorite artists simply for the fact that no matter how well you think you know him you will always find something new and something <laughs> refreshing that's yeah, like yeah. oh my god like this is great you know um let's circle back a little bit to uh the beginning of like ECW you as a wrestling fan, like coming into this, how the fuck did you get involved with like Paul Lee? I mean, obviously around the same area. Like, how did that start? Okay, well, I wasn't exactly a wrestling fan mm-hmm. when I met Paul Lee. Paul, I was a big fan in the Bruno era, which is the generation oh, yeah. before you guys. Yep. When Bruno permed his hair and sat down to be a commentator. At that point, I figured he was never getting the belt back. Right. And I kind of lost interest. On top of that, where I lived in Queens, we were like the last people on the planet to get cable. So when WWF or WWF or whatever they were at the time, when they went off broadcast television, which was in New York, I think Channel 9, WOR Channel 9, when they went solely to cable, I lost wrestling. I had no access to it whatsoever. Mm. Bruno wasn't getting the title back. Backlund was champion at the time. I lost interest. So for the next 10 years or so, the only time I would see wrestling would be on Thanksgiving Day, the pay-per-view that my cousins had on every time I would go to my cousin's house for Thanksgiving. Like Survivor Series? Yes, I'd be watching wrestling once a year. And spending most of the time going, who is that guy? Is he a good guy or a bad guy? Right. When I met Paul Heyman, I had no idea what he did for a living. Absolutely no how, idea. How the hell did you go? If you don't mind, like, how did that happen? Where the hell did you guys even meet? Waiting online to use the bathroom at China Club. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That's awesome. <laughs> True story. Then I, you, when you meet somebody and we're, you know, we're, we're shooting the shit, waiting to use the, the, the bathroom. 
I see him a few nights later at Danceteria or Limelight or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And I kept running into him. And like anybody else in the club world, I was I was in the nightclub world at the time. I was a club promoter here in New York, became friends with him, but had no idea what he did for a living. But the way other people treated him, I figured he was like either a drug dealer, a mobster or a pornographer. You know, <laughs> All the people, above. <laughs> Yeah, he was a little of everything because people kept giving him drink tickets. It's like, Paulie, Paulie, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. This is so and so. And I'd be like, wow, they're really kissing this dude's ass. I had no idea what he did for a living. I found out what he did for a living by mistake. They were doing a, uh, there was a club in New York that was doing a big opening event where they had a jam session, a fashion show magicians and like one of the other events was the presentation of the PWI pro, Res pro wrestling illustrated manager of the year award to Paul E dangerously. Holy and shit. it was on the flyer. It was on the club card. So I get to the club, my friends of mine are in the band. They're in the, they're, they're doing the jam sessions, some heavy duty musicians. Uh, I went th to the club to support the promoters that were friends of mine that were promoting the night. I go up to the VIP room and there's that dude, Paul, but he, he's not wearing blue jeans and a leather jacket. He's wearing a suit. And I'm like, Oh, well, all right. Maybe this is an upscale club. And I'm here looking, you know, like Rob zombie, maybe I'm underdressed. And he's like, what are you doing here? I said, well, my friend Joe is singing in the jam and they got some stupid wrestling shit going on later. I figure I'd check that out. Fast forward an hour later, I'm circling the club. I go back up to the VIP room and they have now set up a six foot uh, projection screen where they're showing Paul E. Dangerously highlights. So I look at the screen over there. I look at my friend Paul over there. I look at the screen. I look at Paul. And the first thought that pops into my mind is, oh, shit, my friend is one of those freaks that dresses up like pro wrestlers. <laughs> It's just, I didn't put two and two together. And he comes over, he puts his arm around my shoulder. He goes, so who is that handsome guy on the screen? I'm like, so that's what you do for a living. Huh? All right. And that's how I met Paul. And that's how <laughs> I found out what he did for a living. He started doing his ECW thing. And I was getting invitations from a mutual friend that we had that was, he was a member of my band, but he did sound for early ECW Eastern, a dude named Mike Lawler. Once a week, I would get an invitation to go to a show. And it, honestly, I don't want to see wrestling. I haven't watched it in years. Yeah. So I used to use the excuse. I had a Bronco, a Ford Bronco with like 300,000 miles on it. So I'd use the excuse. My car will never make it to Pennsylvania. Fine. <laughs> I get a phone call on a Thursday. He's like, Harry, I want you to come to my show this Friday. I'm like, dude, my car won't make it to Pennsylvania. He goes, the show's at the Lost Battalion Hall on Queens Boulevard. It's 15 minutes away from your house. If your car won't get you to Queens Boulevard, I will send a cab. Oh, so I'm like, all right, I'll come see the show. <laughs> I found out that the show is from 8 to 11. So I showed up at 1045. <laughs> Musician, Again, man, <laughs> fucking always running late. Yeah, nothing against it. I didn't know the product. And I had the last time I watched wrestling, it was like clowns and jugglers and plumbers. And it <laughs> yeah, wasn't yeah, my cup of tea. Shit. Right, right. So I got there just in time to save face. You know, Paul saw me there. He introduced me to Sabu, to Cactus Jack. I had no clue who either of these guys were. They were the first two people I met. Went and hung out with Paul afterwards. That's the only reason I went. I went to Lost Battalion a couple of other times, again, showing up right as the show is about to end. Then they started showing the show here in New York at like midnights on Saturday. So I tuned in and I'm like, is this real? Yeah, it was one of those things where I wasn't sure if I was watching a wrestling show or a parody of a wrestling show because the violence was so over the top. So when I finally went and saw my first show from beginning to end, during that show, I saw the gangsters jumping the eliminators. I saw yeah, Big Dick so Dudley putting a guy through a plate glass window. I saw blood and guts and, and all this shit. And I'm sitting there going, this is not the clowns and the monkeys and the <laughs> jugglers and, and the plumbers, you know, and, and the repo men that, that disgusted me. This is like <laughs> stick twisted. This is like a mosh pit at a Murphy's Law show. This yeah. is 
this is Danzig telling the crowd to crucify someone. This is insane. <laughs> right. I like this. So that's how he got me in. And then slowly he had me doing backstage stuff. Mm-hmm. Little things like getting ads in the newspaper and stuff like that. Nothing to do with the product itself. Fast forward, I've gone to a bunch of shows. I've actually helped security on a couple of shows, not because they needed my help, but because I wasn't in the nightclub world. And, you know, if you get an opportunity to knock somebody up the side of the head and get away with it, you take it. And yes. they're done that, bro. <laughs> I'm a pacifist now. I was not so much a pacifist back in ECW. I was a much, <laughs> much, much different person. So um, I forgot where I was. All right. So. I've been doing little things. And then the Monday Night Raw crossover comes up with, you know, WWF. And he calls me up. He's like, I need songs that sound like songs, but aren't those songs. I had no idea what he was talking about. I said, dude, I don't I really don't know what you mean. He's like, well, you know, like on WCW, Diamond Dallas Page comes out. Teen Spirit. He comes out to Nirvana, but it's not Nirvana. I said, no, I really don't know. I, I, <laughs> it's not something I've paid attention to. I went to a local record store because they still existed then, and I bought every wrestling CD I could find. Holy shit. And I went back to my office. I listened to them. I call them back up. I'm like, Paul, this isn't music. This, this is like saturday morning cartoon jingles yeah <laughs> is this what you want he goes yes but no i'm like oh, man did you learn to speak english man i have no idea what you're talking about and he's like i need it to sound close to what these guys are using but not be the song that they're using i said so you want a cheap bootleg knockoff why didn't you just say so in the first place right why do you got to make that complicated dude i sell parts Uh, for a living and motherfuckers try to tell me what they need and it's like the most over descriptive explanation that has nothing to do with what they actually want and i'm like jesus christ so i figured out what paul needed he then told me which songs he needed turned into cheap knockoff bootlegs and i Mm. went and bought those cds because i didn't have them in the office and it was uh, a Kiss song, a Alice War Machine. Chains, yeah, Alice in Chains, Enter yep. Sandman, and yep. one other that I've forgotten about. And I sat there with a piece of paper because I actually write and kind of came up with an idea of how to approach doing cheap knockoff bootleg versions of these songs so they would be legally and technically not even be copies. Yeah. You know, I would have been sued a million times over if they were. I then have 24 hours from 9 a.m. Saturday morning to 9 p- 9 a.m. Sunday morning was the only window of opportunity I had to record these because this was, again, he told me out this about like three days before he needed them, four days before he needed them. So I put together Richie Scarlett um, from the Ace Freely band, Steve Budgie Warner, another Ace Freely alumni. Eddie Wall, who produced Primer 55. And oh, yeah. Geez, I, he produced El Nino, and he's got like mm. 6,000 Emmy Awards for music that he's done. And we recorded this back before, you know, Eddie, when Eddie was still living here in New York in this dingy little studio he called The Palace in a 24 hour period where it was myself and the other musicians just hammering the shit out, hammering the shit out, take a break for cigarettes, go grab something to eat, record more, figure it out as we go along. It's like, you know, all right, this Alice in Chains has this interesting hook. We got to get rid of the hook and do something different, but not use that third chord. And it was just, it was insane because of the limited amount of time we had. So I get the stuff done in, a, in a, literally a 24-hour recording session. I get home, I'm like, I didn't even know what the shit sounded like. You you guys have been in the studio. You know, after four hours, your ears start going numb. Mm -hmm. Okay. We also had a lot of mistakes, some bad tunings. But my thinking was, we don't have time to fix the mistakes. They're going to be playing them with a bunch of people screaming and wrestling going on and commentators talking. Nobody will notice the mistakes. Nobody did. I went to the Manhattan Center the next day. All I wanted to do was get a sound check. We had dats. We didn't even have CDs yet. CD CD burners weren't really a common thing yet. I went there with dat cassettes, little tapes, 
and I wanted to get a sound check because I had no idea if they needed to be EQ'd, no clue. The WWF people, oh no, they sound fine. Like, How can they sound fine? You haven't even taken them out of the case yet. <laughs> right. They wouldn't give me a sound check. So I went to catering. I ate whatever food I saw and Fuck played yeah. cards. I played, I think, gin rummy with The Undertaker for like three hours. Damn, nice. dude. That's fucking awesome. <laughs> you part of that Bone Street crew or what? <laughs> yeah. I thought that was it. I thought I was done. At that point, I had unofficially retired from music anyway. I said, okay, I was on TV. I'm done. About a week or two later, I get a call from Paul. Taz liked my version of his song more than what he was using. And he wanted to keep using what I did for the Manhattan Center for the WWE crossover. Mm -hmm. But there were mistakes. I said, dude, I got to go back in the studio. If you're going to be using this all the time, there's, there's a couple of points where the guitar is way out of tune. I just didn't have time to go back and fix the tracks. Right. So I went back in there. I redid them. We, I had Taz record some of his catchphrases onto a cassette tape. No, that was before. That was, I don't need a weapon. My hands are my weapons. weapons. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. That, <laughs> yeah. Taz awesome. like, wanted school, that, Taz. Echo, that, that echo thing was Taz's idea. He wanted weapons to ring out. So he got what he wanted. You know, we also did a vocal version of that song that was kind of like Sexy Boy. It was just so, <laughs> the lyrics were just so pro wrestling. I'm not proud of it. It's floating around the internet. The vocal version of Path of Rage, where I actually wrote the words, who can stop the Path of Rage when it's headed your way? You know there's no escaping from the Kata Hajime. <laughs> yes. The Kata Hajime. <laughs> I mean, like, seriously, some of my idols <laughs> spend years trying to figure out, should it be, well, I'm a running down the road, trying to lose some, you know, people trying to figure out the perfect lyric to follow the perfect word. And I'm trying to figure out how to rhyme Kata Hajime. <laughs> That's the best. Uh. So that was it. I figured I was done. Little did I know I wasn't done. Harry Saturn ran the school with Taz. So if Taz had his own original music, the Eliminators had to have their own original music. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. For politics, Paul calls me up. He's like, can you um, talk to Saturn and see what he wants? I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> they want what they want. He got exactly he got exactly what he was looking for. He wanted like a synthetic, robotic, post-apocalyptic kind of thing. And. That's what we came up with for the Eliminators. And then again, I think I'm done. One week before Barely Legal, Paul's like, I need some music from you. Fuck, man, why didn't you just wait till Saturday night? <laughs> God damn it, Paul. <laughs> you know, on, you, you need these things for Sunday. Dude, it's Monday. It's, it's six days before. And yeah. on top of that, I have to be in Philly on Saturday for the Terry Funk Banquet. Yeah. So myself and Roderick Cohn, spent five straight nights usually starting at like one in the morning after his regular gigs as a guitar player were done and we came up with the ecw theme in about four or five days mixed went to the show went to the terry funk banquet had all the stuff on dat tapes on cassette tapes i had to master the eliminators music because that also made its debut at barely legal um, there was a couple of things that needed tweaking in between the time I thought I was done and needed to change it a little. So barely legal had both, uh, the extreme theme and the eliminators start. And it was, you know, the, that five days, the night before, literally the night before Friday, we're leaving Saturday morning to, to get to Philly for the banquet. Paul calls me up Friday, like one in the morning. Any chance you can come up with something that sounds like Desperado for Terry Funk? I said, yeah, all I need is a DeLorean and a fucking time machine. <laughs> it's not going to happen, babe. Yeah. And it didn't. <laughs> so that's how, that's how that universe started for me, completely by accident, not something I ever really pursued or tried to do. And then it basically engulfed my life. I never thought we'd be talking about this shit 25 years later, to be honest right. with you. 
dude yeah. you you've uh and and here's the fucked up thing you know we mentioned at the top of the show that you know what ecw was as far as the counterculture the revolution like probably no definitely the most important thing to happen fuck the attitude era and all that shit because they just copied what they saw um the most important thing to happen in professional wrestling in the last 30 years, like hands down, in my opinion, um, the catalyst, there'd be no AEW, there'd be no TNA impact, uh, GCW, GCW, XPW, mm, CZW, CZW, none of that shit without ECW, dude. Agreed. But the thing that you did was right. I mean, not only uh, like some of the most memorable themes, and I want to get to um, one in particular here real quick, uh, but the main, dude, it's extreme. Yes. Well, let me ask you guys a question. I don't know if you know this. What do you think was the inspiration for the ECW theme? You know what? Wow, that's a good question because I've never really. More human than human? Nope. <laughs> hold on, hold on. That's got some of that vibe. It's got some Alice Cooper vibes too sometimes with some of the tone the tone yes we definitely tried to cop the guitar sounds that like nine inch nails and yeah. the butthole surfers and white song yeah. we were using okay gibby haynes what up but take a guess seriously what was what is it that i said that would make i that's what i want to basically base a wrestling theme off of man this is tough. Uh, la, 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 la. I'll give you a hint. It's not a rock song. Wow. Now you're really throwing me off. Right. Because I was going to say maybe stuff, it was something like Danzig. Yeah. I, I do that sometimes with riffs. I hear something else, like some other type of genre music pop or whatever. And I'm like, that would be a killer. Like that's some not disco a shit. No. Do you give up? I give up, man. Yeah. yeah. My next guest was going to be like Rick James or something because I'm trying to go out there because I know you're probably going to surprise me. Oh, yeah. The theme from Jaws. Oh, oh shit. Oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> shit. It's fucking right there. Would have smacked me in the fucking no face way. if it just did. How? I've yeah. heard that theme a million times and I never put two and two Dude, together. I have a That's Jaws amazing. shower curtain. <laughs> but fuck? now that I've said it, can you hear the influence? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Cause the creeping, yeah, creeping on a come up. Yeah, with, awesome. with the movie Jaws, when you heard that, bottom, you knew shit was about to break <laughs> off and get blood, brother, right? dude. That is <laughs> so yeah. fucking awesome. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. Now, when I did it, it was only supposed to be for barely legal. It wasn't supposed to be for the TV show. He kept using. Um, the white zombie tune for the TV show. Yeah. yeah. Um, Thunder Kiss 65. How the fuck? I mean, was he at Paulie's had a million lawsuits and I know, you know, the deal with his, his dad's a lawyer and all that. How was he paying for that to your no. knowledge? No. Okay. Now he's done interviews where he just said, we just used it. And if, yeah. if we got legal letters, we're like, well, why don't you give us the song? <laughs> well, you know, all right. Well, all right. Then, then how about Dude. this? You, you guys f- go to court, spend mm-hmm. a lot of money to file a cease and desist, and all I'll do is stop using it. Right. And I can keep using it and keep promoting it. Yeah, and see, and at the same time, people are gonna find that's what dude america is so fucked up now and like youtube with all the shit you can't have like a split second of <clears throat> somebody else's shit, or it's like you're getting hit with a copyright, you know, like. At the same time, you're promoting that music. You know, I'm mm-hmm. sure there was a generation of kids that found like White Zombie and, and whatever else they were using at the time because they were using the fucking theme songs as wrestling fans. It's yeah. like, oh, that's dude. It's it's promotion, man. Come on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Unfortunately, you got to look at the other side of the equation where the songwriters, their bread and butter is from that seven cents per play. Right, right. Okay, I can speak as as a musician, as a writer. You remember so ASCAP? I was a BMI oh, yeah. guy, to be honest with you. I was with BMI, and I'm BMI. still with BMI. Well, no, that was EMI. BMI. I know, come on. <laughs> God damn it, Harriet! <laughs> now, I, if I had gotten 10 cents for every copy of the Extreme Theme, that got illegally pirated 
on Napster. Holy just shit. Just a dime. Time travel. I would have had like close to a million dollars in the bank. Yeah. You know, there, it's a double-edged sword. At this point, major bands aren't even selling music. They're just giving it away, but they're charging you $3,000 for shitty seats at their concert, and they're charging you 150 bucks for a T-shirt. Yeah, True. it's It's weird. Um, how the music industry has kind of turned and maybe devolved in a way, but essentially also kind of gone back to its roots where it's more the bread and butter now is more your live shows and the touring. And if you're not a touring yeah. band, sorry, you're not going to make shit, you know, like yeah. I, my band suffers the same fate. Like we play shows when we can and we try to, we'd rather just, we all have lives. We have families, you know, we're fucking getting in our forties. We still want to do this shit on a big level, but hey, I want to play this, you know, big fat Maryland Death Fest or, you know, Jamie Jost, I heard, just bought the rights to Milwaukee Altair. Metal Fest. So that'll probably be coming back. Um, want to do shit like that, you know, and then Chicago, Ohio, anything that's close within driving distance. But what you suffer then is like album sales. And especially if you ain't got a label behind you to back you, it's fucked yeah. up. Yep. Well, but things have changed now that you don't really need a label to get your music out there you just need to know how to do it like and yeah. realistically nowadays fuck almost even releasing an release album it on with people's attention spans it's you release a song you got 12 songs milk every single one of those fucking tunes because they're going to be spit up and chewed out you know like mm -hmm. that's just how the world consumes music now yeah, we're back to releasing singles as opposed to albums the way 45s brother <laughs> bring them okay. back the difference is back in the day of 45s, people bought them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, because of streaming services, the piracy has waned a little bit, mm -hmm. but not so much. Oh, yeah. You know, if you really want something, you're going to find a way to get it for free. Oh, yeah. Now, I personally, as a musician, I get that. It's when people send me emails and ask me, hey, do you have a good site where I can download all your music and not pay for it? That always That's got fucked me. up. That's so fucked up. Well, because I replied, I replied to ahead. all of them. Yes, it's the same website that I can get free dental work. <laughs> <laughs> Is this in Canada? <laughs> gotcha. Dude. You're laughing, but I actually had people send me a reply email. Can you send me the link to that? Oh my God. Not surprised, brother. There are a lot of dumb sons of bitches in this motherfucking world. Yeah. Um, now, it, you got a musician like myself. I was never really, I love being live, but my thing was always the studio. I never right. got a bigger rush and a bigger thrill from any live show as I did for moving that final fader and getting that perfect, perfect non-automated mix onto a DAT so we could burn it and master it. Nothing, nothing has ever topped that for me as far as live goes. My mm -hmm. biggest thrills have always been in the studio with just a couple of people coming up with the most perfect possible mix we can after leaving nothing on the table and recording every iota of, of our essence within the track, within the tune, as perfectly as we can. That was the biggest thrill. Now there's no money to be made in that at all. No, no, it's, dude, it's. It, it's so tough. Like I said, yeah, you you got to really adjust to the way music is consumed nowadays and really try to find out how to market it and market yourself. You know, it, it could be done. It could be done easily. I can go in my fucking room right now and and record everything. That's the way the world is. You know, like you, you get on your fucking computer, you can fucking sample drums, do all this shit, do it all by yourself if you want, you know, and dude, I recorded it, an entire album in Garage Man. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Not, not using their loops or anything, but actually tapping, plugging in. Screen. Yeah, tapping yeah, yeah. the screen. Not no real instruments. Mm -hmm. And I wrote an entire album with guitar, bass, drums, violins, harps, wind instruments, all this weird shit that they give you in that track. So it, it turns it into three D sheet music. Is how I look at it. Okay. You know, and yeah, then, yeah, then you can take that. You can go in the studio and you can say to a drummer, listen to this. This is what I want you to play. Hmm. And it's already laid out for them. The same thing with the bass and, and, and the guitars and, and everything else. 
you know, the, the technology advantage, if we had programs like GarageBand with ECW, I'd be knocking out six tracks a week. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, sure, you know, Paulie, you're sure you don't want any more? <laughs> exactly. Dude, I, there would have been guys would have had seven different themes. Each. <laughs> you know, one, your entrance theme, your exit theme, your run-in theme, your promo theme, because the digital world made it so easy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it fucked a, like you said, it, it fucked a lot of shit up for us, man, as far as trying to, and, and the other part, the evil side of it is, yeah, there's easy, it's easy to get on Spotify or iTunes and all this shit, but dude, you're not get as a, as an artist, you ain't getting shit from that. No, it's like, no, no disrespect, but dude, we try, Hey, buy the shirts, motherfuckers, pro wrestling tees.com forward slash JPW tees. Guess yep. what? Might get a buck from every shirt you fucking buy, you know, like. It which is a, a dollar more than them, you know, stealing the music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> See, but I'm the type of fan. Check this out. And I, I don't know if you can respect this or not, you know, but like you're saying, you know, with the dumb people calling in like, Hey, where can I get this for free and not don't get me wrong because if something came out, I wanted to have it early, especially like in the Napster days, I thought the great thing about that was I didn't necessarily use Napster back then for say you're putting an album out. I was going to wait for that album to drop, but you got a bunch of B sides and live shit that has never been put out. That's mm -hmm. your only way to get some of this shit. And that's dude, how I, I got so many different bands, like stuff you would never think you'd ever have access to through that way. But then on the other side of that, okay, if I want an album early, yeah, I would download it, but guess what? I'm the type of guy and type of consumer that will, and even still to this day, I'm buying digital, I'm buying physical, I'm going to see the fucking concerts and then mm -hmm. I might buy an extra copy while I'm at the fucking show, yeah. you know, like to me, that's the okay way to like consume. Like I might take it for free, but guess what? I'm giving it back tenfold because I'm yes. going to buy, you know, that's the way you got to do it because it's, it's music. It's there. It's something that you own because you wrote it. But once you put it on that fucking digital platform, it's out there. It's, it's, Technically, don't hate me for saying this, but it's everybody else's at that point, you know? Yeah. You know, I went and saw a band right before COVID went, you know, took us all down. And they had this awesome idea. Free CDs with the purchase of your $35 T-shirt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, normally the T-shirts, what do they go for? Like 20 bucks? It normally depends. 20, Brother, I just saw Danzig for in Cincinnati. No, no, um, not for a local band. For a local, oh, local band. band? Eh, like we try to do ours and we get some pretty nice shit done. We try to make it as cheap as possible. Like 15 to 20 bucks. Yeah. 25. Yep, then that's, that's when you're looking at like, man, who the fuck these guys? Ten dollars for are? plain <laughs> logo tees. Yeah. Well, they were selling their t-shirts, $35, which included the free CD and the free poster. That's baller. That's Good the packet. way to do it, man. Good packet. It's technically not, it, you're not getting anything for free. No, they added, no. they added the cost of the CD and the cost of the poster to the cost of the t shirt. But the way they gimmicked it with the audience, I saw people going, Oh, wow, that's a great deal. And they would just go buy it. And I'm like, Hey, good for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's with, with music, like with everything else, you either adopt, ad I'm sorry, adapt to what's going on around you. Or you become the dinosaur staring at that bright light in the sky, wondering why it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Exactly. This is true. You know, you Good either adapt, you, you either adopt to the, the circumstances you are presented with or you become extinct. For sure. Yep. But, and then you got to think outside the box on top of that. Yeah. yeah, you have to. That's that's the only way to do it. Um, but going back to like, you know, what I was saying uh, about how important and like Dude, that theme, that ECW theme is what, fuck, man, that's what everybody fucking remembers, you know? Um, and I, I was got, curious I mean, I, as to this, because when the buyout and everything happened, do you own the rights to that shit anymore, or is that all Vince? I would need a lawyer to really answer that question. Okay. Hmm. Um, they purchased a portion of the publishing mm. as to... Where the sound recordings sit, I have no clue. But that whole thing is so far in my rearview mirror at this point 
that while there's a lot of negative things I could say regarding that deal, I don't violate my contracts, even if other people do. Right. So there really isn't that much I could talk about regarding the purchase of my ECW music catalog. It's a, it's a gray area. I'm sure if you, if detectives out there really want to go through court documents and shit, you could find out, but in a nutshell, they purchased the, a portion of the publishing and I'm supposedly still getting paid when they use it on the network and stuff. I just don't think I've seen any of the money. <laughs> like a lot of people, brother. And that's oh, yeah. fucking horseshit. Cause you know, when, when you, when you're a solo practitioner like myself and the other guys have like, well, we've got 600 attorneys on retainer across the country, you know, like, yeah, you know, it's like any fight, you know, I'm good for one, two, maybe three people, you know, I'll slug it out with you. Right. But when right. there's 10 of you, I'm just going to curl up into a ball and hope you don't kick me in the nuts. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the nuts are the worst, man. The low blow uh, always get you. <laughs> always roll them up for the schoolboy. One, two, three. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, you were talking earlier, too, and uh, shout out to Sabu, man. Him and uh, Melissa, RIP to the Super Genie, man, uh, were a guest on this show. Um, and Sabu was another guy when we had him on. It was cool because he was like, you know, I, I like to have people on kind of, you know, sometimes it's like during the program, fuck the wrestling side of things. I, I want people who know you guys to kind of get to know you a little bit better and what you're into. And he he threw out like, man, I'm really into like Sabbath and Judas Priest and shit. And I was like, mm -hmm. no shit. I, I don't I don't know why I would have never saw that coming, but uh do we had him on the show and hookah blues, like I said earlier, man, is just that's another one of those songs that's just so fucking iconic, man. You hear that shit. I remember back in the day, like first hearing it, I was like, oh my god, dude, like somebody roll up a fucking split. Let's fucking <laughs> just listen, get lifted, dude, and and fucking bang some fucking heads to this shit, dude. Thank like you. And, yes. and I know you mentioned earlier about how you had all these different influences, you know, this influx of different musical tastes coming in for that. But like, do you remember the exact moment, the recording session for that song and what was going yeah. on then? It had nothing to do with ECW. This was an idea I had for a song mm -hmm. and it wasn't written for Sabu. Oh, shit. Hmm. Yeah which is probably why it's such an iconic song. It's, it wasn't a cookie cutter approach like mm -hmm. enter Sandman by Metallica was not written for Sandman, right. but it's become, you know, part of his identity. So, yeah. so identifiable and iconic. The idea I had um, was to use a drum beat rhythm section, like China white by the Scorpions. Fuck. Yeah. We methodical plotting. You Don't know, be so close minded. Bum, bum, bum. The rhythm parts. Here's another one for you. The rhythm guitars of hookah blues was inspired by the song March of the Monsters from the old Godzilla movie, Destroy All Monsters. Yes, it's one of the best Godzilla movies. <laughs> Bodies okay. Fucking I love Godzilla. Don't get me started. In, when when this thing's over, you guys go to YouTube and, and do a search on "Destroy All Monsters" theme. Yes. And much like Jaws, your mind's going to be blown when you hear it. You're going, <laughs> oh, wow! The saxophone, which is my my buddy Arno Hecht. Arno has toured with Robert Plant and James yeah. Brown, and you know he's he's been with the B-52s. He this Ooh. this dude has toured with the Rolling Stones. Wow. Like one of the most accomplished musicians on the planet. Arno came in and he was just going to double the guitar parts, just mm. reinforce them. When the track was playing, he was warming up and he started throwing out some disjointed Middle Eastern stuff and I'm like, "Stop." I took the paper away with the chords and said, "Forget this. You're not doing this. <laughs> what you just did OK, I'm not going to give you musical directions. Let's let's go with with Star Trek. There's a belly dancer on the other side of the room with three of the biggest boobs you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> what is this total recall? All right. But That's great. She doesn't understand a word you're saying, but she will understand your saxophone. Get that green three boobed belly dancer from Rigel seven to come to this side of the room and service you with your saxophone and go. 
<laughs> there it is. And that was the direction for him. When Paul heard it, he's like, this is incredible. I just had no idea who to use it for. Really? It really wasn't apparent for Sabu. They were thinking Shane Douglas at one point, Tommy Dreamer. And then somebody out of left field is like, you know, the saxophone is kind of Middle Eastern. Wouldn't that work with Sabu? When Sabu first heard it, I don't think he liked it. He thought it was too slow. No you know, shit. That, he was using... Um, no, he wasn't the Judas Priest. He's all about that turbo lover, you know? He was using um, Little Crazy by Fight, the Rob Halford uh, side band. Mm -hmm. Okay, he was, which is a much faster tune it's 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 more up tempo than hookah blues when he wanted to try using it the dj tried to speed it up but it made it sound like shit and i'm like i'd rather you guys didn't use it if you're going to speed it up and make it sound like alvin and the chipmunks you know <laughs> so he tried it the first time and then by the second or third time he came out to it he realized he didn't have to run out there all crazy and psychotic throwing chairs he could take his time walking to the ring and it fit with the groove of the music. So oh, yeah. it, somehow or another, it ended up marrying me to Sabu because he used that for the rest of his career. And even when he went to other companies, when he went to TNA to impact wrestling, yep. they did a knockoff, a, a, yeah. a cheap generic bootleg knockoff. Like I did years earlier, they did that to hookah blues. <laughs> How did it feel? <laughs> I, I was flat. Honestly, flattered. I was flattered. Yeah. You have to. You have to be. At that point, that was the closest I ever came to hearing someone do a cover of one of my tunes. Now, as musicians, you guys know, we all have like a bucket list, mm. like playing Madison Square Garden, you know, could be up there for some people. I never got played at Madison Square Garden, but my songs were played inside Madison Square Garden during a live pay-per-view. So that's if that's as close as I get, that's as close as I get. Make it. Having yeah. the Grammy, well, that probably ain't going to happen. Gold, platinum record, nah, there's still time, but who knows? But hearing a cover, holy fuck. And now there's like four or five guys that have done covers of my stuff on YouTube, and I'm like, this is awesome. This is flattering. Yeah. I watched That's one crazy. today of the Blues, and it was fucking amazing. Oh, no, it's another cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> But why, you ask? Why another cliffhanger? Because it's better and easier and more wonderful to listen to it this way. You little babies. Tune in next week for episode 199, part two with Harry Slash. You gonna Still do sex to me? Did you like that video? If so, be sure to hit like and subscribe and check out more killer content from your boys at Juice Pro Wrestling. Whoa, yeah!